Good to be here. Hallelujah. It's good to be here. And uh, we're going to launch out today. And we're going to bring up some controversial stuff. But uh, the Lord Jesus Christ was very controversial 2,000 years ago. And believe me, he still is today. Oh, yeah. Mention his name around the wrong people and you have to duck. <laughs> Mention his name around the right people and you pucker up. <laughs> Amen. All right, turn to Psalm 139, verse 14. Psalm 139, verse number 14. All right, 139 verse 14, David said, I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. Father, I pray now, Lord, for the gift of teaching. I pray for unction. I pray, Heavenly Father, for illumination, Lord. As you reveal it in the scripture, Father, you said that you'd commit thou to faithful men who should be able to teach others also. I pray that I do not lead astray, nor get off into heresy. Keep me right, Lord, and keep me straight. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, now, we know that we have been created. We're creatures. We know that God breathed into that first man's nostrils, and he became a living soul. We understand by that, therefore, that we are here as a direct action from God, the Creator. And there's much to say about God as the creator throughout the Bible. It's much to say about him as the savior throughout the Bible. All of these different aspects. But this morning, I want to talk about some things that bear very heavily upon you and the world that you're living in right now. Right now. This world. Right now. At this very moment. The scripture says that we are wonderfully made. Now, a fellow by the name of Crick a few years back discovered what's called DNA. They've known about it now for long enough to begin to experiment with DNA. And by doing that, they are entering into a whole new world, a world that uh, they did not know existed until that. Just a little bit of history to lay a foundation for where we are right now. You know that Darwin published his... Uh, his uh, book on evolution back in the 1800s, Darwin, my dear friend, was not original with evolution. You need to get that. He was not. He borrowed heavily from work that had gone on before him. He was not original. But when he did, he brought it out and it was accepted by the world because they wanted something as an alternative to the Bible, something they could turn to apart from Scripture. Because scripture has a way of speaking to you, not only intellectually, it'll make you think, but it'll speak to your heart and it'll tell you what you're made out of, your relationship with God. So Darwinian evolution came into vogue in the 1800s. A lot of the offshoots of Darwinian evolution have produced to this very day and are still producing some of the most violent, heinous, wicked, vile people that ever walked the face of this earth, and some of those people are in the highest positions of leadership in the world. There are kings and queens and presidents and prime ministers and chancellors and so forth and so on. They have been directly affected by the thinking, the philosophic, philosophical processes of evolution. Evolution is not simply a simple term. It has to do not only with biological evolution, it has to do with social evolution. Not only does it have to do with biological and social evolution, it has to do with spiritual evolution. We'll be talking about that in a few minutes. It has to do with an element that they cannot put under a microscope, but they admit there's something going on. If you remember, I told you two of the greatest questions you could ever pose to someone. You could pose these questions to someone and they have a hard time answering them. And one of these questions is this. You hear this stuff all the time, constantly, about evolution, 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 evolution. But it's obvious, if you have half a brain, that there is an intelligence going on out here. There is something designing what you're seeing. And it more than design, it's upholding what you're seeing. And there is an, there is an intelligence that's involved, and they cannot define it. That's the issue. They cannot define it. For example, if you take yin and yang and put it in a circle, you know, the, the, the key, you, you've, got, uh, 
You've got on the flag of South Korea is a big emblem of yin and yang. You've got a male and a female, all right? These counter each other, balanced to give the one inside the circle. They teach that once they separate, the yin and the yang separate, then your spirit leaves and you're a dead man. Now, the Bible says in the book of James that the body without the soul is dead, right? Now, just threw that out there, folks. That's not what it says. The body without the what is dead. See, I'm going to catch you. I'm going to make you think. This is not an entertainment session. When you, when you come in here and say amen, amen, you better watch what you're saying amen too. <laughs> amen. The body without the spirit is dead. You say, well, they're the same thing. Oh, no, they are not. I, I know there are those who are called dichotomists and they teach that you have the body and the spirit and the soul are identical, but they get all of their proof from the Old Testament because there's not a clear delineation made in the Old Testament between the spirit and the soul. But you get to the New Testament, there is a definite difference made. And the reason for that is because if you have been born again, Colossians chapter number 2, your spirit has been born of God and you have had a spiritual circumcision take place that separate you from this body of death. So in any event, there is an element out there that they can't define. And they don't like that. Unfallen men do not like the idea that they can, are not in complete control and don't, and don't know everything. They don't like that. So this element that they cannot define is, uh, is, a, is a mystery to them. Now, a few weeks ago, a man by the name of Ken McDonald came by church here. I don't know if you remember him. He sat right over here, brought his wife with him. He's a real, real precious brother. He left this book with me. And this book has to do with healing, and it has to do with Eastern mysticism, alternative medicines, and so forth and so on. I was going through his book the other day, and I came upon something I thought would be very interesting for you, because what he's doing is saying in a different way what I've been trying to say to you about this life process. Now, here's what he says. This is Defiled, Brother Ken McDonald. New Age medicine claims to have the answer and cure for any sickness you have. For them, the cure is energy. Watch that. Now, energy. Can you put energy under a microscope? You can, can you see energy? No, you can't see it. You see, New Age medicine claims all sickness originates from the same source, and that is an imbalance in your energy. The Bible claims all sickness originated with sin when Adam and Eve disobeyed God, partook of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, Genesis 3.6. At the root of the New Age medicines, a belief in a, listen to this now, universal life force. You remember I was talking about that a few weeks ago before I went on vacation, a universal life force. In other words, a universal spirit. The term for this belief is vitalism. This unbiblical belief is defined as, quote, a doctrine that the functions of a living organism are due to a vital principle distinct from psychochemical forces. And this is a quotation from uh, Vitalism, P. Grove editor, Webster's Third New World Dictionary. Vitalism is outside the physical, thus making it metaphysical, otherwise known as the occult. Now, you see, you've got to be careful with stuff like this because if you're publishing papers in the scientific journals in America and you are a world-renowned evolutionist, you know, you, you, you fit in the scientific field, you have to be very careful who you associate yourself with and you've got to be very careful with the words that you use. That's very important or your papers won't get published and you'll be demonized. In other words, if you are a creationist and believe that God created everything, even though you know as much as any Harvard graduate and you can publish the papers as well as he can, you are ostracized, demonized, because you don't fit in the old boy's camp. Bottom line is this. They talk about intellectual freedom and freedom of speech, but they don't believe in it in a heartbeat. Amen. Not at all. Not at all. Remember the Christians out there in Oregon? who would not bake a cake for the sodomites. You remember that? You remember the Christians? You remember the state of Oregon came down upon them and, 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 and brought the full force of the law of that state down upon these two people and it wound up losing their business, costing them tens of thousands of dollars? Why? Here was the argument. You have a public business, therefore you have an obligation to serve the public. All right, that sounds nice and clean on the surface of it, doesn't it? All right. Just a few days ago, 
a restaurant owner comes out and says, we will not serve Donald Trump. We will not have Donald Trump in our business. We will close our doors to Donald Trump and everybody applauds him. You know why? Amen. He belongs to the old boys camp. He's a liberal. Is there a double standard in this country? Amen. You better believe it. So then what does that mean for their law and their order? That means it is, it is the law you abide by and not them. In plain words, intellectual freedom, freedom of speech, the press, the press in this country, the fourth estate, makes a big deal about their right to publish or print the news, right? And they should have access. This is why the Freedom of Information Act. The Freedom of Information Act means that we have, we press, we the press have a right to any public document that pertains to the public or anything of that nature, and you can't shut us out. So they, they preach long and hard about their right to the freedom of the press, but they'll take your right of freedom of speech away from you in a heartbeat. How do they do it? They do it with political correctness. If you don't march to their tomb, preach their party line, use their terms, bow to their gods, you will be ostracized. Now, what it's done to your mind, I'm going to tell you what it's done to your mind. It has closed your mind down, and a lot of people are living in absolute frustration this very minute because they cannot speak their mind. So, this man says that the idea of a universal force, a universal spirit, and all of that is the occult world. That word occult means the hidden world. So this is the foundation of New Age medicine. Vital force is what the holistic doctors are preoccupied with. It's their whole focus in terms of how they, are, how they treat an individual. The life force has many names. I've read there are over 90. Yet with all these people studying this life force and naming it what they think it is, still to this day, they do not know. Nor can they for sure tell anyone what it is. Is. Listen to D.D. Palmer. To the Hindus, it is called prana. To the Chinese, ki. To the Japanese, ki. To the Hawaiians, mana. Hippocrates referred to it as vis medicatrix naturae. Galen called it pneuma. That's the Greek word for spirit. And on and on and on it goes. But do you know what the Bible says? The Bible says that he upholdeth all things by the word of his power. That invisible God speaks the invisible word that holds the visible together. And you'll never see that invisible God or ever know that invisible God unless he makes himself known to you, and he did. When the Lord Jesus Christ showed up, he was the invisible God made visible so that man could see in flesh and blood and bone God manifest in the flesh. And that's what the, that's what the Bible teaches and I believe the Lord Jesus Christ is God Almighty manifest in the flesh. So this life force that we're talking about, so what is it, preacher? I can't define the Holy Ghost for you. I can't define the Spirit of God for you. I can't define a spirit for you. You remember when I told you before, there is not a soul walking the face of this earth that can give you the essence of a spirit? Remember I told you that? I've said that in here time and time and time and time and time and time and ad nauseum. I've said it so many times. I want you to get it though. Nobody can define the essence of a spirit. Oh sure, he's like fire, he's like a dove, like the wind, water and all of that, but these are only types. God is a spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. So what are you saying to us, preacher? I'm saying this. I cannot define what's holding this world together, but I know it's the Holy Ghost. And I know it's the Holy Ghost by the power of the spoken word of God. It's upheld by the word of his power. The same word that created holds it together, and it is invisible and undefinable, but it is the spirit of the living God. And see, that's, that's the difference between me and them. I know what holds it together. And they're so close in one hand and so far away in another. Plato went back and talked about the monad. He talked about this spirit, this spirit that permeates everything and that we eventually go to this spirit. So they grab that and all of them accommodate it to their own cultures. And that's what's happened today. That's where it is. These people that are preaching this stuff and teaching this stuff are giving what you want to hear for public consumption. Public consumption. Now, how many has ever heard of Cecil Rhodes? Rhodesia. Some of you have. Cecil Rhodes was a very brilliant man, a very wealthy man. He made a pile of money down there in Rhodesia. 
And he was a one-worlder. Believe me, he was a one-worlder. But he also believed that the white race was vastly superior to the black race. How many ever heard that on CBS, NBC, and ABC? Fox News and CNN. You won't hear it. You know why? Because Cecil Rhodes established what's called the Rhodes Scholarship. And the Rhodes Scholarship was, uh, was given to the, the top 1% of the top 10%. In other words, you have to have an IQ on up there of about 100. And I think starts 140, 45, 150, somewhere on up in there. you got to be smart, 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 smart. In other words, to qualify. Did you know we've had a president who, belonged, who had a Rhodes Scholarship? How many know who it is? There you go. William Jefferson Clinton, the former governor out there, where was it, Arkansas? He is, always will be, a Rhodes Scholar. Now, if you accept their scholarship, that means that you accept their principles, don't you? You embrace, now I don't get off into a bunch of stuff with you, I'm just trying to make you think. So who's running for president? That's his wife. Who met with the Attorney General the other day? The Rhodes Scholar, and she's a colored woman, black woman, African American, whatever the terminology happens to be in 2016. I've watched it change four or five times since I was a kid. Amen. I sure have. And it's a, it's, you know, why all the change? The change is for confusion and control. Because anytime you confuse somebody, you're going to control them because they don't know what's happening. But anyway, you come back to Bill Clinton. Bill Clinton is a Rhodes Scholar. This man, Cecil Rhodes, wanted to create a one-world government, and he wanted to make Great Britain the seat of it. Great Britain was going to be the seat of a one-world government, and he was going to control the, 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 the natural resources of the world, the money of the world, the armies of the world, and all of that over a period of time. And so he instituted various means in doing it, and one of them was to create the, what's called the CFR, the Council on Foreign Relations. The CFRs created, the purpose of it is to, it's a think tank, to bring about a one world government. Now this is important. Do you know what gives life to these people? Do you know what is, do you know what is the inspirational motivating factor in their lives? It's that spirit that Plato talked about. You see, they believe that that spirit or that, 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 that life force, that vital force itself is evolving because it is a non-distinct, it does not have a personality, it's not a person. It's just a spirit. It's just, a, it's just some kind of a force out there that they have to acknowledge that, let's say, for example, that you're with someone and they pass away in a hospital room. How many's ever been there before? It's quite an experience, folks. I've been in there many times as a pastor. Many times I've been right there when that soul leaves the body. Right there. One moment you've got a human being laying there. One moment you've got someone in the image of God. The next moment, you got an empty shell, and you can tell it. You can walk in this room this morning, and you can walk up next to someone, and they, they don't know who you are, but if you get close enough to them, they'll feel you. Do you know why they feel you? They're feeling your spirit. That's why they're feeling. That's what they know. And somebody said it was a distance. They've measured the distance, 18 inches, 12 inches, what have you. This and that. I don't know anything about that, but I know this. I know that you are a spirit being living in a body, and you have a soul. And that's what makes you what you are. All right? Now, you take an unsaved natural man who sees things in the natural realm, he would, he would deny that in a heartbeat because he's a natural man. He only knows a natural man is not necessarily a moral man. He's not necessarily a mean man. He's a natural man. That means that he judges everything he knows or understands by what he can understand with his five senses. That's it. That's as far as it goes. When it gets past that, it doesn't exist. So intellectually in his mind, he thinks. And the mind is the only part of your body that knows it exists. Your mind is thinking right now. What did he say to me? <laughs> You're not thinking about that with your toe. <laughs> That's right. Your liver? Sure not. What is it that's thinking about what I just said to you? 
your mind, not your brain. The brain is the functioning part. It's a organ. But the brain has in it a mind. This is why the Bible said, let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus. The apostle Paul said to put on the new man, take off the old man. When you get in there and start studying that in the New Testament, you find this, and it jumps right out in your face. The old man is not a bunch of thoughts about what you used to be like, memory banks in your brain. The old man is a real person who has his own mind. And the new man is a real person with his mind. And they're going to butt heads. And that's what's going on. That's why the battle inside you. Now, a Christian knows that. And when you get into the spirit world, like I'm talking to you about here this morning, you're a Christian. You understand that. You know God's a spirit. When people talk about demons and they talk about all this other stuff like that, you say, oh, I know what you're talking about because the Bible's plain on that. You understand that. You see, it's not, this, it's not this hidden realm and this mystical thing. You're not mystified by it. You know what's going on. It's an evil spirit. So when this world starts talking about this spirit that's moving about in their mind, this, this spirit that's evolving, that brings us to my next point. Now, please listen to what I'm about to bring to you. Have you ever heard of CRISPR? Some of you have. See, some of you folks, like this brother and, uh, 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 Kukendall down here, he, he keeps me on my feet, boy. He's read everything. He's read stuff I've never heard of. <laughs> he gives me stuff to read. And I say, thank you, brother. <laughs> you remember what I told you? If you don't use another man's brains, it's a good indication you don't have any of your own, right? <laughs> you better believe it. Somebody researched something, put some work into it, I'll use it in a heartbeat. <laughs> The difference is don't get up and plagiarize yourself and say it's yours, that you're the author of it. Give credit where credit is due. CRISPR. What's CRISPR? CRISPR has a direct relationship to DNA. Now, you might have thought there might not be a connection with all this stuff I've been giving you, but there's a direct connection because what I'm going to show you is the connection of the philosophy behind it. I'm trying to show you how that the men that are in this stuff justify everything they're going to do by this spirit, this life force that has, along with the biological evolution, it has evolved itself into this place where they are today. Now, how many have followed me so far? I know I'm laying a lot of stuff out here on you this morning, but I want you to think with me. If you are a research scientist and you're dealing with editing the DNA structure of a human being. And by doing that, you are creating an entirely new line of descendants from two people. That's some heavy duty stuff, right? This is far, 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 far advanced to, uh, to a, a Petri dish, uh, what they call it when they first started impregnating eggs back there. Uh, I forget what it's called, 30, 40 years. Uh, Artificial, yeah, yeah. This is way past that. This is getting into the actual DNA and the ability to reprogram DNA to program desired, uh, let's say, uh, uh, intelligence, uh, appearance, uh, things like that into future generations. This means, of course, it doesn't mean anything to us because we don't have that kind of money. But to the people that have the money, oh, yeah. To the people that have the money, they have their own designer babies now from generation to generation. They're getting into something that, uh, that is Pandora's box. How many of you have seen photographs on, on the web of goats with a face that does resemble a child? It's out there. It's sickening. And I'm not saying I have the answer to it. But there's an awful lot of people out there that think they're experimenting, already have been for some time, with animals and injecting human DNA into animals. And for there's, Some have said that they're doing this to animals to grow human parts, human body parts, so they can use it you know, for, for uh, medical science and so forth. All right, but it's out there. It, it, it certainly is. All right, you remember what I told you about a chimera? What's a chimera? 
What's a chimera? A chimera is a combination of animal and human. Okay, androgynous means male and female. All right, how many remember what androgyny? I told you about that. What's going on with androgyny? All right, male and female together. Baphomet. How many remember me talking about Baphomet? How many's ever ever seen a, a picture of Baphomet? All right, Aleister Crowley, that was his god, Baphomet. All right, you've seen a picture of Baphomet. And when you look at that, you say to yourself, hold on a minute here, there's something, <laughs> something strange about this creature. Yes, there is. He or it is both male and female. Now, I ask you a question. Have you seen a lot coming down from the federal government about mixing the genders where men can walk into a women's bathroom where little 10, 12-year-old girls are using the bathroom, and here comes this man in there, and he says, well, I'm a woman today. How many have seen that? And this is why the people over there in North Carolina, God bless them, the people in North Carolina, their legislature has kicked it right back in the face of the federal government. God bless them. <laughs> and I'm, I'm glad they have and keep praying for them. And, 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 and the revival is still going over there in, uh, in uh, what's, uh, Burlington. And I don't know about West Virginia, but God bless them. Amen. <laughs> They're kicking it back. See, why are they doing that? They know it is way out of order. They know there's something bad going on. Now, when we get into CRISPR, they've already gotten into the point now to where they can take the DNA, the DNA, even of so much as a hair sample, and reconstruct the facial features of the one that that hair belonged to. Now, if you're a burglar kicking the doors down, robbing people, and you let a hair fall in that house, you're caught. They have technology today that will blow your mind. If you thieves and burglars haven't kept up with surveillance technology, you're going to get caught. You're going to get caught big time. But this is the medical side. And you know when I read that the other day, I watched a video on it, I thought, I never thought about this before. It had never come to my mind, but all of a sudden it just came out of the clear blue and had come from God. They were talking about being able to reconstruct the facial features using DNA, a 3D model, three-dimensional. I thought, what if they took the DNA of an aborted baby? You know, the little glob that they sell to the public? That's not a glob, but the little glob. If they took the DNA of that little glob and reconstructed the facial features of a 30-year-old man or woman, it'd be a lot harder to kill that baby, wouldn't it? If you knew what it looked like when it was grown, wouldn't it? It'd be a whole lot harder to kill it. Last figure, uh, it's hard to get an exact count, anywhere from 58 to 60 million, maybe even more than that, children have been aborted in this country. 72 to 78 percent of all abortions in America are on black people. Now let that settle in. There's a website on there that's called Black Genocide. And this brother is a preacher on there that, run, that runs that website and he says that his race is being decimated systematically in America through abortion, 72 to 78, even up to 80%, listen folks, of all abortions are on black children. Very, very few of them are in hospitals. Most of them are in clinics. Clinics scattered out through the community. Clinics. Now we have Planned Parenthood and Margaret Sanger and evolution. How many has ever heard of eugenics? And I've taught about it in here before. Did you know that all the way up until I think it was the 50s, 60s, I don't have it written down. It's been a while since I've read it. 
Some of the states in this country, some of the states in America were still sterilizing people. Did you know that? Sterilizing them. Did you know that Margaret Sanger, the one who started Planned Parenthood, this is a fact, they can't sue you over it, it's a fact, said that certain people are useless eaters, human weeds. So what do we do, what do, we do with weeds? We pluck them up and get rid of them. Now, let's put two and two together. If Cecil Rhodes was a firebrand racist, and he was, and he was the head of a one world government movement. And today we have people who are systematically wiping out certain races from the face of this earth. It seems to me like that the leadership of the one world utopian global movement wants to get rid of a lot of people. They've already said the earth, the population needs to be reduced. And they want to get rid of a lot of people, and they're starting with the colored races. They're already doing it. You don't hear that on CBS, NBC, and ABC, CNN, Fox, and the rest of them. You'll never hear it on that. You know why? Because they're all part of the globalist movement. Globalism has just been rejected in Great Britain. It's called Brexit. And David Cameron, the Prime Minister of Great Britain, fought it and thought he had won over it until the vote was taken just a few days ago and the people of Great Britain, by a four-point margin, voted to get out of the EU. They knew something was going on. Something was wrong. Now, how many here today, this is July the 4th. Now, how many of you know what July the 4th is about? I don't want to offend you. Did you know that they've been running surveys with people on the street and they're asking them about July the 4th and they don't have a clue. Now who's to blame? Those government brainwashing centers, right? That's who to blame. So what are you saying, preacher? I'm saying that they did not think it was necessary to teach those children about the American Revolution. Now, why? Here's why. By not teaching them about the American Revolution, they're telling them by not teaching them, they're saying it's not important that you identify as an American or as a patriot to this country. It's important that you identify as a global citizen. So we're going to take your national identity away from you. Now, now I'm not up here to to support Donald Trump. I'm using this to teach, to, to make a to comparison. Donald Trump is a populist and a nationalist. Let me tell you what that means. A populist means that he's in touch with what's going on inside your soul, that he can understand that there are millions of people in this country out of work because of NAFTA, TPP, PPPPP, and all the rest of it. They're out of work. The, the, these, uh, these, the middle class is being destroyed. And when these people come along today and, and pander with you, just toss out a little bit for you and say, oh, we're going to work for the middle class hogwash. All, a, third, a third of the manufacturing in America, a third has gone overseas. That's a lot of jobs, folks. That's a lot of jobs. And a lot of you, no doubt, have lost jobs. And they say, well, no, so many jobs were created. What, flipping hamburgers, ham hamburgers at McDonald's? Well, the unemployment rate's only 5%. You don't believe that. The real unemployment rate's at least 30 to 35%. A lot of people drop out of it because they can't find a job. All right. You know, you could go on and on and on. Here's bottom line. Donald Trump is preaching a populist message, but he's also preaching a nationalist message. What's that? America first. That's nationalism. America first. You say, well, that's, don't you think that's kind of selfish? No. Let me ask you a question. Are Americans going to Mexico or are Mexicans coming to America? Which one is it? They're coming here. You know why they're coming here? Because the standard of living here is still 
so much better than it is anywhere else. And I'm going to tell you why I believe the standard of living is so much better here because God has blessed America. He's blessed us. He's blessed us. But the bottom line is he's preaching a populist nationalist message. Now, we've got Republican bigwigs like Brent Scowcroft. Isn't that his name, Scowcroft? Who was an advisor under one of the presidents. Big wig Republican. Do you know what he just said the other day? I'm going to vote for Hillary. Now let that settle in. Think about that for a minute. When somebody came along and they said years ago, you know there's really not a whole lot of difference between the Republicans and the Democrats. They knew what they were talking about. They knew what they were talking about. You see, Donald Trump has completely upset the new world order. He is, he is definitely not in their camp. And Vladimir Putin, who is definitely not in the new world order's camp, he's not in it, folks, came out and publicly praised Donald Trump talking about his intelligence and he thought he'd be able to work with him, so forth and so on. It may simply be that Vladimir Putin is saying to Donald Trump, I understand where you're coming from. I know what you're doing. You know who I am. You know what I'm doing. Neither one of us are part of this globalist one world movement. See what I mean? A one world government is coming down on you like you wouldn't believe. It's coming, folks. I mean, it's coming. And these globalists are going to ram it down your throat. They, why do they do it? They do it because they have that superior spirit. They have evolved to the point to where they will literally design the next race of humanity. They are in the upper, upper echelons, and you are the useless weed eaters. Uh, weeds, you're the useless eaters. You're just, you're, just, you're just fodder for the cannon. That's all you are. And when they communicate with you, they come down to your level and they speak to you on your level and they use the terminology on your level they brainwashed you to receive. They have defined the terms and they've taught you what those terms mean. They don't mean anything to them, but they've defined the terms to communicate with you and they feed that to you and the people just buy it and gulp it in. That's what's happening. And the people in the church house go Sunday after Sunday after Sunday and nothing changes. It all gets worse. And you ask yourself the question, why is it we put all these people up there? We put a Republican Congress up there back in 2000 and when was it? Uh, 13, 14, whenever it was. And what changed? Nothing. Do you know why? Because they're all in league together to bring about a one world government. And the movers and the shakers and the big league and the big dogs in the Republican Party are rejecting Donald Trump, showing their true colors, and they're saying, never Trump, you know, I'll support Hillary. And I say, okay, boys, you're doing exactly what you need to do to wake a few people up in the country as to what's going on. The political parties are not going to save you. But it is a remarkable thing to watch the way they are aligning themselves now and what's being said. They are going to have a one world government. So why is that important to me, preacher? Because the Bible says in Revelation chapter number 13 that he causeth all, everybody, to receive a mark. And they cannot buy or sell except they receive that mark. In other words, he is in control of worldwide commerce. And that's, that's, to me, that's an amazing thing. How in the world can somebody not be aware of it in living in this generation? Globalism. Here's what's happened. In the last two weeks, there has been more said about globalism than has been said in the last 20 years. Right? How many of you have, how many of you have heard all this talk now, even coming from the fourth estate, the news media, about globalism. It's coming out now. It's, in, it's, it's out there. And how in the world could anybody know anything about their Bible and support something like that? And Donald Trump may turn out to be one of the sorriest things that ever walked the face of the earth, but we already know the rest of them are sorry. 